Father, we thank you for your love and your mercies. You're just always there. Help us, Lord, to understand you want us to also be always there. Help us understand. Help us have the experience you want for us. You have aimed us high, and you want us to experience this with you. Bless us now as we look into your word. May we learn something that will help us and help someone else too. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, before we start, I really would like to hear from you. <laughs> if you have something to say, write it down. <laughs> if you have something you want to talk about, write it down. Let me know what you're thinking about. These meetings can get pretty dry if it's just me telling you things. But they don't get that way if you're talking to me. <laughs> All right. Something really struck me in Sabbath school today, and I want to begin talking about that. You know, I go a long time without reading Sabbath school lessons. <laughs> I just am not involved. And I stay away from them because they kind of rile me up. <laughs> They say things that I just have a hard time with, realizing that somebody at the top levels of this church are saying things <laughs> that don't really hold. Now, I know there's a reason for it. The author of these lessons does pretty good. But then those little green boxes you know somebody else is writing those because they don't say the same thing that the lesson teaches. <laughs> and so what we have here is committees getting involved in this Sabbath school lesson, messing things up for us. We have to stay on our toes. Today something, I mean, it just, I looked at that and I said, now who in the world would say that? And who are they saying it to? I'm going to read it to you. This is on Sunday, February the 8th, at the bottom. I don't know if you have yours with you. Okay. At the bottom is a little box. It says this. How much time do you spend thinking about Jesus, focusing on his life and what he's done for you? You know, if somebody ever asked me that, I'd have to look at them and say, where did you come from? What do you mean? How much time do I spend? <laughs> In the song books, maybe you ought to get it out and read it while we're talking here. There's a song, Moment by Moment. Page 507, I think. When I first became exposed to God and His ways and His people, this is one of the first songs I ever heard. Now, when uh, I heard this, I want you to understand something. I was in a meeting. The people were singing. And it's the first time I'd ever heard anything like this. I grew up as a heathen, <laughs> a rank heathen. I had never heard a hymn in my whole life. And all of a sudden, I hear these people singing. And here's what they're singing. Dying with Jesus, by death reckoned mine. Living with Jesus, a new life divine. Looking to Jesus to glory doth shine. Moment by moment, oh Lord, I am thine. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> and it just melted me. I couldn't believe it. I said, are there people like this? <laughs> is there a God like this? Is this who Jesus is? And that's just one of the, the hymns in here. They're all like that. <laughs> Let me tell you, 
Every time somebody sang another hymn, I was listening to those words. I said, how can people write like that? Well, I know you come to church and you sing the song because you're standing up and everybody sings a song. They put the book down. If you were to ask people, what did you just sing? <laughs> you're just supposed to do it. It's that time of the service. <laughs> Where's the heart? I mean, where's the, oh, oh, this is about me and God. The refrain, moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I've life from above. Looking to Jesus to glory to shine, moment by moment, oh, Lord, I am thine. Somebody comes up and asks me, how much time do you spend thinking about Jesus? What's wrong with you? <laughs> He's always there. <laughs> I mean, what are they saying? You can be a part-time Christian? Sometimes you think about Jesus and the rest of the time you're doing your own thing? What is that? <laughs> I have to tell you, this devastated me when I read that. I said, how did that get in front of Seventh-day Adventists? First Thessalonians 5, it says, pray without ceasing. Well, how, how much is that? How much time do you get off from that? <laughs> pray to who? To God the Father through Jesus. Moment by moment, pray without ceasing. Always, no matter what you're doing, you're connected and you know it. Whatever else you're doing is secondary. <laughs> oh. How? Does a, live, a Christian live without Jesus for one minute? <laughs> now, I got to thinking about this. <laughs> I said, you know, this person, whoever it is, or this committee, whoever they are, posed this question because this is what they do, first of all. Part-time. And the second thing is they know other people just like them. And maybe the majority of people who go to this church. And then it really hit me. Oh! <laughs> what a terrible thing has come into Seventh-day Adventism. What a terrible thing. How can anybody sing that song with a clear conscience if it's not true? Maybe you know other songs in there. But like I say, all of these hymns got to me. <laughs> and they still do. I'm telling you, I came from heathenism. <laughs> and I knew the difference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was more than an atheist. Thank you. I was more than an atheist. Let me tell you, I was an enemy of God, an avowed enemy of God, because I said, he doesn't exist. That's who I used to be. There was no doubt in my mind. There is no God, and I can prove it. Send me to any church, and I'll show you there's no God. <laughs> I used to enjoy tearing down Sunday keepers because <laughs> they proved there was no God. I didn't know it at the time, but the Lord probably had me in a certain place. I could never become a Sunday keeper. <laughs> That's before I knew about the Sabbath. <laughs> 
And that's why I opened up to the Sabbath, because I realized, you know, I have a real controversy with all these churches and all these people, but I don't have that with the Sabbath. <laughs> I don't have that with the God of the Sabbath. I don't have that with the people of the Sabbath. It was different. It was different. So I was open to that. It says, I saw hypocrisy. It was more than hypocrisy. It was a lie. <laughs> and it still is in my mind. There are Christians over there, but not because of those churches. Those churches are Babylon. That's what God says. And I believe that 100%. Oh, this stirred me. <laughs> How could we, as Seventh-day Adventists, have sunk so low that we can put that in there? And churches everywhere in the world who get this read it, and they don't see a thing wrong with it. How does that happen? It's under the heading, Preaching the Gospel. <laughs> <laughs> That's supposed to be the gospel. <laughs> Ooh. How do you prove that the Holy Ghost is a person too? Will we get to see him in the world to come? Well, you're asking questions nobody can, can answer. Theologians, reformers, Scholars, no one has been able to answer these kinds of questions. Calvin said, if you want to ask these kinds of questions, you will drive yourself insane. You won't get an answer. <laughs> Why is that? When you go home, you get into the book, Acts of the Apostles, page 52, and you get out your pencil so that you have this down and you're never going to forget it. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. God has not revealed it. <laughs> Now then, when somebody comes along and they say, well, I can prove the Holy Spirit is a person. The first question you ought to ask is, where are you getting your information from? Because God hasn't revealed it. <laughs> Ooh, there's only one other source, isn't there? <laughs> you just watch out for the person who thinks they can answer that kind of a question. Yeah. Now, I know we were all taught. I know what we were all taught by well-meaning people, but they didn't know what they were doing. I'll tell you why. Jesus said, the Spirit will not testify of Himself. Now, the word himself in the Greek can just as easily be translated itself. And you will notice in the writings of Ellen White, many times she says it. It. The spirit. It. <laughs> so, she does it both ways. She says him because that's what the Bible says. But then she other, to other places says it. The influence of the spirit. It. And the word influence is there a lot of times. The reason we can't have anything to work with to prove something like this is because if Jesus said, in fact, which he did, that the Spirit will not testify of itself, then the Spirit, whatever the Spirit is, is never going to talk about itself. So what do we have to work with? <laughs> We have nothing to work with coming from God. What is the Spirit supposed to do? Testify about Jesus. That's the function of the Spirit of God, is to bring us Jesus. 
Now, I just let something slip there. I don't know if you caught it. I said the Spirit of God. I have my own ideas on the subject. I have my own convictions on the subject. But I can't teach those as truth because I have no place to go except the few things the Spirit of Prophecy says and what the Bible says. And that's not enough to prove anything. <laughs> okay? Since you asked the question, I'm going to lead you to one place and you just think about it and pray about it and then realize you're in deep water. <laughs> Manuscript releases, number 14, page 179. Now, I'm going to tell you what's on the page. You go read it. You go find it, and you see what it says to you in the context. The statement is this. The Holy Spirit is the omnipresence of Christ. <laughs> That's a heavy statement. You need to be very careful with this subject. The only thing I would like to warn you about is this. Don't change the word of God. You better keep the word of God the way it says. In Colossians, when it says, the hope of glory, what is it? The Holy Spirit in you? Is that what it says? It doesn't say that. It says Christ in you. Well, now, either the Bible is true or it isn't. What do you get when you become a Christian? Jesus Christ, by impartation, he brings his life to you. He becomes part of your life. Not something you don't understand. Jesus, you understand that. Don't change the word of God. There's nothing about a third person in that scripture. It's about Jesus. 1 Peter 1, verse 11. I just want you to see how deep this is and why we can't make pronouncements. Oh, this isn't working for me now. Um, okay, there we go. It punches above. All right, I think maybe we better start with verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you now notice, this is all the Old Testament people, the prophets, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now I want you to notice two things in this verse. The Spirit of Christ is called it. <laughs> The translators miss this one. It says it. The second thing I want you to notice is that every single prophet in the Old Testament prophesied through the spirit of Jesus, which was in them. Which spirit? Don't change the word of God. Don't say the third person. The, the Bible says the spirit of Christ. Now, the spirit of prophecy never fights this. Never. If you're listening carefully to what she's saying, she never goes against any of this. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 366. She says, All the communication 
between heaven and man has been through Christ. Oh! <laughs> that doesn't leave any room for anything else. So, it, in trying to reach something on this, I can't tell you there is no third person. I can't do that. But I don't have enough to work with to say there is. Because you can say the word third person several ways. Just in the English language, if I was, were to say to you, I'm going to speak to you in the third person, what am I saying grammatically? I'm not going to use the word I or me. I will use the word he or it. That's third person. <gasps> Is there something here we're not getting? I don't know. I don't know. This is too deep for anybody to say, I know there's going to be a Holy Spirit third person in heaven because my brain immediately tells me, how do they know that? Does the Bible ever say there's going to be three thrones? No, they said the Father and the Son. Do you know that in all of the salutations of Paul in his letters. He says, from the Father and the Son. From the Father and the Son. From the Father and the Son. From he never says, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He never does that. Why not? Because I don't think he wanted to start a war. <laughs> I don't think he wanted to start a controversy. Well, we don't need to either. <laughs> We need to leave it just the way the Bible reads. Now, we're going to get ourselves in big trouble if we try to be like everybody else. Do you know where the three gods comes from, the idea, if it's not in the Bible? It comes from the Catholic Church. They call it the Trinity. Now, I have seen in our books... Discussions of the Trinity. Well, Ellen White never uses that word. Where did they get it from? <laughs> the Bible never uses that word. Where did they get it from? It's a Catholic word. It's a Catholic idea. And I think we need to be careful what we are adopting from the Catholics. <laughs> Now, there's something very difficult about this because there's a group of people out there who have tried to study this and have come to some rather interesting conclusions. And because they teach what they teach, we don't want to be anywhere close to it. You know who those people are? Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> yeah, they say, we can't prove there's a third person. We call it the force. Well, <laughs> we, we start jumping up and down. We get all mad. Look what those Jehovah's Witnesses said. Well, I don't like the word force. <laughs> That's a terrible word. Let me tell you what I think about that. The Father. Jesus said the Spirit proceeds from the Father. Didn't he say that? In John, he said the Spirit proceeds from the Father. How can it proceed from the Father? It's the Father's Spirit. It doesn't say he's sending another personality. It's the Father's Spirit. So, when Ellen White says the Spirit is as much a person as the Father, what could she be saying? It's the Spirit of the Father. <laughs> Why wouldn't the Spirit be the same person as the Father? <laughs> You can't have two different things and be the same person. <laughs> and there are a lot of things like that in the spirit of prophecy where she says something, but if you're programmed to think a certain way, you'll never get to what she's really saying. Never. I'll give you an example in another area. See, you don't know the can of worms you open up with these kinds of questions. <laughs> We were talking about the 144,000. There's a lot more we haven't said about that subject. But let me just say this. 
In one of the manuscripts, and I'm aware of it, and someday somebody's going to pound me over the head with it and say, ah, here, you can't answer this. Well, okay. <laughs> here's, what, here's what it says. Ellen White says, the 144,000 is not all the redeemed. And they say, see, see, your theory doesn't hold because that's what she said. Well, I know she said that, and I've had to wrestle with it and work with it and see what's going on here because all the evidence is contrary. So I have tried to think through what's happening here because we don't have why she said that. That's the problem. We don't know why she said certain things. We just have her response. So I thought, well, what would prompt her to say something like that? Can I think of a question knowing what I know that would elicit that kind of response. And I came up with several. Here's one. Suppose somebody said to her, the 144,000 is not all the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. It's all the redeemed. Now, how would she have to respond to that? She'd have to say, no, it's not all the redeemed. Without answering the rest of it, that it's the Seventh-day Adventists and the redeemed together. Now, she never said anything like that in one place, but she did say it in several places, and I can give you those several places. But part of the problem is we, all of us, were taught to believe certain things, and then from then on, everything we read has to follow that thought. You have been programmed to believe what some Seventh-day Adventists told you. And when the pastor says it every week, it pounds it in further. <laughs> now, where did he get it from? Another Seventh-day Adventist of modern times. We are steeped in traditions because we are not reading the Bible the way it reads and the spirit of prophecy the way it reads. We're putting things into it. Let me give you another one because I want you to get this. You're in danger if you're paying attention to what men say instead of studying for yourself. When that special resurrection happens and all the faithful ones to the third angel's message are raised, in what condition are they? What does that mean? Glorified. Well, here's one thing it means. They can die because they're not immortal. Yes, you see, I see the eyebrows go up. That word glorified means they are still mortal. They can die. Well, why is that important? Because there's going to be a death decree. <laughs> and they are just as subject to it as the people who have never died. So it's really important to put these words in the right places and see what's really happening here. Special resurrection. Every Adventist who's going to heaven is alive at the same time. The living saints, 144,000 in number. And then the death decree. They all can be killed. But of course, nobody's going to die after probation closes <laughs> among the Christians. So we put all the facts together and we get a good picture of what God says instead of what we were told. <laughs> Those, who are pierced him will be raised. Those who pierced him, they will die again too, won't they? Sure. <laughs> it all fits. There's one thing about truth. You can't put a hole in it. <laughs> you can approach it from any side and now it works. Okay, let's see what else here. What about Matthew 28, 19? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? That's a good, good question. That's good thinking. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy I've done it many times. <laughs> but I have no problem with it. You know why? There's no name there for the Holy Ghost. What's the name of the Holy Ghost? There's no name. Nowhere in Scripture is there a name 
for the term Holy Spirit. There are only two names in the Bible. Jehovah and Jehovah Emmanuel, the Son. There is no name for the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe there is, but uh, we won't get to that. <laughs> the point is this, that when a person is dunked in the name, how many is that? It didn't say names. It doesn't say names. It says in the name of God in Jesus Christ. There's only one name by which we shall be saved. Isn't there scripture that says that? We are baptized in the name of Jesus. <laughs> that includes the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I have no problem with the scripture. <laughs> it fits everything else, I understand. But I have to tell you, this doesn't come overnight. You have to agonize. You have to pray. You have to ask God to talk to you. You have to be willing to stand out there all by yourself. Yeah. And you have to be ready to say to God, God, if you wanted me to know this any other way, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I'm ready to say that to the Father. Yes. If you want me to know this a diff different way, show me. <laughs> if you don't want me to know, okay. <laughs> Deuteronomy 29, 29. The hidden things belong to God. But those things which he has revealed belong to us. That's part of this lesson, the spirit of prophecy. God has revealed to us certain things. He has told us he is spirit. John says that. God himself, the Father, is spirit. Does that mean he's not a person? Of course not. It means he's spiritual. And it means that he can do things by his spirit that we don't understand. We don't know how it functions, but he can do it. I had a debate with Desmond Ford one time. And he brought up the point about the spirit. He says, my God is bigger than your God. I said, oh, is that true? I said, well, my God requires me to be perfect. What about your God? <laughs> and then he says, you know, Jesus, well, he was a human, couldn't be every place. And now, in heaven, he's still a human, and he can't be every place. Yeah, that's what Desmond Ford said, that Jesus, and I know there are Adventists everywhere who believe that. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous. Who is Jesus now, right now, this second? He's God. He's God. Are we going to tell him he can't do something? <laughs> he can be any place he wants to be. <laughs> that human body doesn't stop him one inch <laughs> because he's God. He's spirit. And I know it's true because he's in me. <laughs> and I know he's in you, he's in you, he's in you. Yeah, he can be in all of us at the same time because he doesn't deal with time the way we do. See? These things are big. But don't get locked into doctrinal discussions that you can't defend. <laughs> don't do it. We have bigger things to talk about. Romans 5 verse 9. Let's see. And I'm glad you're dealing with these things because you just can't let them go. You've got to think about it. But you finally have to get yourself in so high you realize, I'm not getting anywhere with this. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. What did I say? Romans. Let's look at the verse 9. 
I think I didn't put juice in this. Okay, let's start with verse 8. Thank you. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I want to stop there just for a moment. When did he die for you? While you were a rotten, horrible sinner. While you hated him, he died for you. Now, he didn't ask you for permission. <laughs> he didn't ask you what you think about it. He did it because that's what he had to do. If there was any possibility at all of you responding, he was going to be there. And so while you were an enemy of his, he died for you. Now, I want to ask you, if that's what he did, is he waiting for you to get good now? <laughs> he didn't need that to die for you, did he? He didn't need you to get good. He died while you were rotten. <laughs> and I hate to tell you, you by yourself are never going to get any better. <laughs> never. <laughs> All right, verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Justified by what? His blood. You mean not by what I did? I gave up wine. I took it out of my refrigerator. I, I shoved it down the sink. Now I can be baptized. Well, I gave up cigarettes. That's tough. <laughs> Uh, he wasn't waiting for you to give up your cigarettes. Well, I, I have a, a bad temper. That was a hard one for me. No, he's not waiting for that either. He's not waiting for anything. He justified you by his blood without your cooperation. As we were. <laughs> no. He did it without you. Now, we've been saying this for seven years here, more than that probably. <laughs> and I know we still have to work on it. <laughs> I know. Jesus justified you by his blood. Now, that is really pretty big. That is big. But notice what Paul says after that. Much more than... Being justified by his blood, we shall be saved. You mean I'm not saved yet? No, I'm not saved yet. Not even the blood? Well, the blood is the means of doing it. But the blood by itself is not going to save me. Now, there's, I know I get in big trouble over that. Because there's lots of people, lot of people want Jesus to do everything. And we do nothing. And they think it all happened at the cross. Well, it didn't all happen at the cross. That was the sacrifice. What a tremendous thing. That will be the focal point in all eternity that he was willing to do that. But that by itself does not save us. Yeah, Paul says, much more than that. Oh, the first time I saw this, I couldn't sleep. I said, how can you have much more than that? <laughs> how can there be anything else more than that? But Paul knew what he was saying. He says, much more than we shall be saved from wrath through him. What him? The living Jesus. The right now Jesus. Where? In me. So Paul is telling us the ultimate truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the green at the bottom. That the living Jesus right now is my salvation. Right now. No history. 
These, I'm sorry to tell you, these are all history. They tell me that Ellen White was poor. She had to borrow 25 cents to get a table and some broken down chairs. Uh, she, t- she tells us about the senators becoming corrupt and the legislators passing laws. Uh, uh, we know that God talks to his people through prophets. It's all history. What good is it? I don't need history. I want to know right now. Where am I with Jesus? What's he doing for me right now? And do I have it? Someday we're going to wake up and stop putting these things in the churches. We're going to do something else. No, I'm not against these because it gives us something to talk about. (laughs) At least we get started. (laughs) But I sure have a hard time with some of the things they put in there. Verse 10. For if we were sinners, excuse me, if we were enemies, there it is, there's the word, plain and clear. For, for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, oh, there it is again, much more than the cross, much more than the death of Jesus. That's what he says. Much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Oh. How can somebody come along and ask me, how much time do you spend thinking about Jesus? <laughs> oh. That person ought to go home and stay away from everybody. That's a dangerous person. The person who has Jesus loves to talk about him. I'll read you a statement like that here in a minute. Let me see what else do we have here. Are you finished with who is Israel? No, we're... I'm I'm trying to lead up to these thoughts because if we are Israel here, the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, is how we live. Does anybody here not like the testimony of Jesus? (laughs) You know there are some people that don't and they don't realize what they're saying. They don't like what Jesus has to say. How can you be a Christian and find yourself in that condition? That's not possible. There's a person, or I'm dealing with some of these things every week, who wrote me a little note, oh, we had to, you know, talk about love. (laughs) And so today in Sabbath school, I asked the question of the people there. I said, do you suppose... That what Jesus tells us is love? (laughs) And then I proceeded to read several statements from the spirit of prophecy that I know they didn't like. And then I asked them again, what's the problem here? This is Jesus talking. This isn't me. And it's not Ellen White. It's Jesus. Why do you find it? Irritating. (laughs) You know, if we're reading these books correctly and we see Jesus talking to us, to me, directly, there's only one place I can go. Next week, I'm going to tell them this. You know what we read last week is still there. And it's going to be there next week and a month from now. And a year from now, it's never going to change. If something has to change, guess what? <laughs> yeah, so what do we need to do? We need to get down on our knees and say, Lord, that, that terrible thing you have revealed is me. That's me. I don't want that. But... 
I have to confess in my inmost soul to you in all honesty, that's me. Help me. I thank you for your forgiveness because I have Jesus. I have the forgiveness. But now I need the experience. I need to be willing to be made willing to do whatever you say. Anytime. Let me read a couple things here. God's Amazing Grace, you probably have this little book. It was one of the daily readings. May 9th. Jeremiah 31, 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now that's God's promise to people who enter the new covenant through Jesus. I'm going to read the comment. Same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. God writes it. That's what he says. Has he done it to me? Has he? Yeah. See, we don't want to say history. He wrote it on those tables. I want to know, did he do it in me? Did he write it there? Is it there? Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Now, I'm going to ask you point blank. Are you obedient in Jesus? Absolutely. The Father sees perfect obedience in you. So why are you walking around mopey face and saying, oh, oh, oh I have such a hard time obeying. Come on. <laughs> I know people who make themselves sick wondering if they're ever going to obey. <laughs> Jesus has obeyed for us. Now, that, that's not the end of the story, but that's an important part. Yes, we need to get that first. That's where we start from. The Father sees Jesus' perfect obedience, and he says, that's me. That's me. Then, <laughs> then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts, having the Spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as he walked. Now, what did she say? Having the... That's what she called the Holy Spirit, two senses above. Do you see what I mean about the deep water? We just are not reading the words the way they're written down. We're trying to invent something else. Now, the reason you shouldn't... It's that Trinity. It's that Trinity infusion. Say it again. Trinity. It's that word Trinity. Reason? Is the reason. Oh, yeah. Our brain gets in the way all the time. You know your brain has been educated to not believe the gospel. The devil taught you how to destroy the gospel. You all went to school, didn't you? What do you think they teach in those schools? They teach you how to do it the devil's way. And I'm including the Seventh-day Adventist schools, and I can prove that. I'll give you a simple one. When you were in school, the teacher looked at you, gave you a test, and based on that test, she put you in the bell curve, and she said, 
you are a C student. <laughs> and you said, oh, I'm a C student. <laughs> can I do anything about that? Well, you can try. But right now, you are a C student. You're probably going to always be one of those, but you can try to do something else. So I go through school, the devil's school, and they have taught me the big lie that the devil wants me to believe. I am a C student. I'm part of the average. I will never be <laughs> that A-plus student. That's not me. Now, why is it so important for the devil to teach you that early in your life? Because he knows that Jesus is powerful and somebody is going to become a Christian. And here's what the devil wants you to carry across from his education. You are a C Christian. You're just an average one. <laughs> and if he gets you locked into that, oh, you're going to have some major problems because then God comes along and he says, there are no C Christians. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm one. <laughs> I said, no, there's no such thing as a C Christian. There's no such thing as a B Christian. Yeah, but Ellen White. No, no, no. <laughs> I will never be like Ellen White. I'm not asking you to be like Ellen White. I'm asking you to be a Christian. What's a Christian? It's pass fail. You either are one or you're not. There's nothing in between. No A, no B, no C, no D. You see what the devil did with the schools? He put it in everybody. And I dare say you're carrying it around right now. How can I surrender fully and be like Alan White? Well, it's easy. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. There's nothing stopping you. Nothing at all. You know, when I had churches to deal with, I would have a meeting the first time I met the elders. We would all sit down, and I asked them, have you all been voted to be elders in this church? And they said, yes. You accepted the position? Yes. Do you know what that means? You're going to be in the homes. You're going to be visiting with people. You're going to be finding out what's going on in this church. You're going to be out there to help. Now, there's another thing I want you to know before we start. When I called an elders meeting, you are all going to be there. <laughs> are you dictating? I said, no, I'm telling you a fact. You are going to be there. And they never heard anybody talk like that before, so I tell them what I'm saying. I say, you know, I don't know how many of you have daughters, but if your daughter met somebody she really loved and you gave your blessing and all that, and she's going to be married, I want to ask you, are you going to be there the day she gets married? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Why? <laughs> because you want to be there. Nothing's going to stop you. Nothing's going to stop you from being at the elders' meeting. <laughs> you said you want to do it? You're going to do it. <laughs> we all do what we want to do. <laughs> you want to surrender? Surrender. <laughs> yeah. Same page. There are two errors against which the children of God, particularly those who have just come to trust in His grace, especially need to guard. The first is that of looking to their own works, trusting to anything they can do to bring themselves into harmony with God. Now she said this is the first error that new Christians make. Have we gotten past that first error? <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that if I were to ask each one of you here, you would all tell me the same thing. I'm not into works. <laughs> no. 
it, and you would believe it. You would tell me that in all sincerity, no smile on your face, as, as innocent as it can be, telling me I do not believe in works. Well, I want to tell you something. If you're anxious about anything, you believe in works. <laughs> you're still looking at yourself to see how you're doing. <laughs> God never told us to do that. He said, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. See if you have Jesus. So, if you have Jesus. That's the first one. He who is trying to become holy by his own works and keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. Now that's Jesus talking to you. Jesus just said that to you. That if you think you're finally going to get to the place where you're doing what you understand about keeping the law, you're never going to get there. Can you hear the voice of Jesus? He's trying to help you. He's trying to get you to understand. You know you're going down a one-way street of disaster thinking that. Give it up. The opposite and no less dangerous error is that belief in Christ releases men from keeping the law of God. <laughs> that since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. If the law is written in the heart, will it not shape the life? <laughs> you see how simple that is? If it's there, it's going to do something. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render obedience. So first, I'm justified. And in that instant, I become a partaker of Christ's righteousness. He writes the law in my heart. He makes me a new creature. And now I live moment by moment, kept by his love. You see? And, and the song comes to life. It's us now. Every single second of my life, I'm a Christian. And the temptations are going to come. They're going to be there. The devil has, the, you know, God lets the devil come at us so we can get built up in the faith. But we have some things to decide. Do I want to live the way I always have? Or do I want to be developing and growing and learning what this is? <laughs> There's only way I can get there. In Christ Object Lessons, page 116, it says in the, in the scriptures, Jesus is portrayed as a gift. But the man went out and sold everything he had to get the pearl. He sold everything to get the gift. <laughs> And many wonder at the meaning of this. Well, Jesus is a gift, but only to those <laughs> who give themselves soul, body, and spirit to him without reserve. So who gets the gift of Jesus? The one that gives themselves to him. It's a trade. <laughs> now, if a person doesn't do that and they're just joining a church, nothing happened. Yeah. You can join a church easy enough. That's no problem. You can get dumped. You can get people calling you brother, sister. <laughs> but getting Jesus, and he wants it more than you do. Getting Jesus means he gets me. <laughs> On page 118, same book, she says, to be almost saved does not mean to be almost lost. 
but entirely lost. Page 92, Mount of Blessings. She says there is no such thing as a neutral position. We either belong to Jesus or we belong to Satan. Now we can go on and on and on. There's nothing hard about this. It's very clear. It's very positive. All right, continuing. Where there is not only a belief in God's word, but a submission to the will of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, the affections fixed upon him, there is faith. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Through this faith, the heart is renewed in the image of God, and the heart that in its unre Nude state is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now delights in the holy precepts, exclaiming with the psalmist, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. And the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Hmm? The Spirit of Christ. Yeah. Don't make this an abstraction. Don't make it something you can't think about, you can't talk about, you can't share with somebody intelligently. It's Jesus in you. It's his obedience that works. The presence of Jesus. I'm telling you that question. <laughs> How can a Christian live without the presence of Jesus for one microsecond? It can't be done. All right, I want to read you that honest statement. 3T252. What greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they're all wrong. The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. This church, I don't know how many people come here. I've never seen you on Sabbath morning. But... But this church has people in it who are honestly deceived about their condition. They think everything's okay. And they're honest. That's what it just said. They're not being evil about it. They're honest. They really think everything's okay. <coughs> While those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in an exalted spiritual condition, the message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. The testimony so cutting and severe cannot be a mistake, for it is the true witness who speaks, and his testimony must be correct. So don't go looking around. <laughs> don't look around. You'll find lots to look at if you do. <laughs> don't look around. That's where these people come from who are sending out tapes and, and magazines. That's all they do is look around. They don't realize they're the biggest problem. No, you get on your knees and you confess, God, I don't know myself. I don't know myself. I'm deceived about my true condition. You must take me, and I know you will, just the way I am, and turn me into what you want. Show me what I need to do to cooperate with you. Show me how to make the connection and to stay there all the time. Yes. You know, Jesus has promised, he says, he will never Cast away anybody that comes in his name. Never. He can't do it. And in Desire of Ages, it says that the honor of Christ is staked 
on the perfection of his people. He has to do it. <laughs> He's going to do it. We have to believe it and start stretching. <laughs> we have to believe it and stop saying, I'm as good as that one. I'm as good as that one. I don't steal. I don't. I hate to tell you this, but I'm going to. I had one of the leaders of the independent ministries, a big name that you would all know if I said it, come to me and up to my face and say, I don't commit adultery. And I could give him 15 examples of the adultery he committed that week. Spiritual adultery. How can a person say, I don't do this? That's our problem. <laughs> we have a problem. It's called sinful nature. Do you know you're not going to give up your flesh until Jesus comes back? <laughs> There's going to be a harvest. You're going to be spiritually brought to perfection, yes. And then he was going to, he's going to give you your new body, immortality. But until then, we have something to do. <laughs> it's a fight. It's a terrible fight. We know how it's going to end. Yes, Jesus has to be victorious. But don't give up fighting because if you find a reason not to fight anymore... You've given in to the devil. You have said, I accept the way things are. I believe in sin. It's always going to be here. <laughs> Don't believe in sin. Believe in redemption. Fourteen eighty-seven. the only hope for Laodiceans is a clear view of their standing before God, a knowledge of the nature of of their disease. Now I'm going to give you one so you know it now and you can stop listening to those tapes and whatever you're doing. Testimonies to Minister 22. When men arise claiming to have a message from God, but instead of warring against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in this world, they form a hollow square and turn the weapons of warfare against the church militant. Be afraid of them! They do not bear the divine credentials. Yeah. Oh, but there's lots of good stuff in there. Nice quotes, hey. God said, be afraid of them. They're going to take you down. How do I know that? The Bible tells us about Cain. What did God say to the leaders of the organization? said, you know, there is sin in the camp. And that means I cannot do with this people what I want to do. I cannot bless Israel. You go get rid of that sin. And so they <laughs> started breaking it down until finally there he was. And he wasn't going to fess up, so they asked him. You know, what, what have you done? <laughs> Would you tell us what it is you have done? And finally, I said, well, I took some of that good stuff. It was so pretty. It's the gold and the little statues and the robes. It's just so nice. And I buried it over here. I said, show us where you put it. God says... We can't have this in our midst. The spoils belong to him. He's the conqueror. We didn't conquer. The spoils belong to him. You ruined the whole thing. You are corrupting the whole nation by what you, a one person, did. You corrupt Israel. You have to die and your sons, and your daughters, and your animals, and everything that you have touched. 
one man. Have you heard about when Cain and Abel were out there? Cain killed Abel, right? What did Cain do? Well, he didn't die. God did not have execution that day. He let him go out to see if he would change, to see if he would become a Christian. Well, he didn't. He just got harder and harder. He rebelled. That one man, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us, remember, that's Jesus talking to us. That one man corrupted the whole earth so that God had destroyed the planet. One man. What's going on today in God's church? Do we have one man that's corrupting the church? We have a problem. In some places, they're running the church now. Now, we're not going to change all of this ourselves here, but we need to understand it exists. We need to be praying that we are faithful where we are to do our part to influence back to Christianity. Not back to, to what we think Adventism is, but to Christianity. And we can do that. One Christian in a church can love in that church also. <laughs> so wherever we go, we should be the ones that never compromise, not because we're good, but because Jesus wants to use us. So when we run across lessons like this, instead of just sitting there, we might ask some questions <laughs> and get people to thinking. Better than that, we can have a Bible text or two or a spirit prophecy to quote and say, you know, this says this. What do you think it means with this? <laughs> we have something to do. Remember, Ellen White tells us who are going to be the saved ones. The early writings, 70, 71, she says, those who cry and sigh for the abominations in the church. Are you crying? Are you sighing for what's going on? Does it get to you? It should. Desire of Ages 83. We should spend a thoughtful hour each day meditating about the life of Christ. Every day set aside for just that. And then it says that as we do that, our hearts will get in, into it. And then she says, especially the closing events. And the reason she says that is because we are, all of us, going to do the same thing Jesus did in the closing events. The mob is going to come for us the same way it came for him. We're going to know it's not time to use the sword. We're going to be put before, in front of judges. We're going to, step by step, we will be humiliated. We will be abused. We'll do everything except go to the cross. Step by step. Because Jesus wants to make a demonstration that what he did was not unique in humanity. That he has a whole people at the end of time who do it the same way he did. By the same spirit. <laughs> okay. Oh, we have so much to be thankful for. We are really privileged. All right, let's keep going. We're going to get back to the, the themes of Israel, but that's what we're talking about here. We want to know we are the real Israel. There is no other Israel except what God has outlined. They're like Jesus. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you never blame us. You know who we are by ourselves. But we're so thankful that we're not by ourselves. We are not just humans. We have received Jesus. And everything you gave him while he was on this earth as a man, 
you make available to us. Nothing is left out. If we will be in subjection to you the same way he was, we will do the same things. Help us, Lord, to understand that the Spirit of Jesus in us will do the same thing that it did in him. May we understand that he's even now living by that same Spirit. And today, all the power of heaven is at our disposal. We don't need to think about history. We have today. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.